I've been asked to say a few words uh, today about uh, the very dramatic events that surrounded the creation or establishment of Czechoslovakia in 1918, events at the heart of my book, that one, um, and the events which liberated the Czechs and Slovaks from uh, many hundreds of years, if not a thousand years of uh, oppression under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When I was looking at my notes a minute ago, I realized that some of you might not know what the Austro-Hungarian Empire is or was, so um, what was that thing called Austria-Hungary? Um, what it was was a, di a dynasty that um, controlled um, the heart of Europe, about 11 or 12 nationalities. Um, the dynasty was the Habsburg dynasty, whose family over many centuries discovered that they were German at one point. Um, maybe a thousand years ago, one's ethnic identity was not so important. They would have called themselves Christians. Um, but um, in 1914, Austria-Hungary occupied present-day Austria, Hungary, of course, the Czech and Slovak republics, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, northern Italy, southern Poland, and the western regions of Ukraine and Romania, if that gives you a picture. If it does give you a picture, give yourself an A for geography. Um, it entered the war, the Great War, as a great power. It was only the size of Texas, but in Europe, that's, that's pretty big. It was a great power. It was the second largest in size and the third largest in population among all the warring parties. It disappeared in 1918 in the in the flash of an eye, and I'll, I'll tell you how that happened. Um, I'll be delighted to answer any questions you might have at the conclusion of my remarks, but I will answer your first question right now. Why is it that a Irish, Scottish, American, no Czech or Slovak background, why did I write this book? I'm glad you asked. The short answer is that the exploits of the uh, Czechoslovak Legion in Russia as well as a political, a sort of a parallel political campaign waged by exiles, Czech and Slovak exiles all around the world, um, was nothing less than amazing. I was telling some, someone earlier today that I'm, I'm 60, oh, I'm almost 61 years old, um, but I, I just haven't lost my, completely lost my, my appreciation or my sense of awe. I'm still able to be awed by Olympic athletes or crazy people who climb mountains, and, um, and, and I'm really awed by the Czechs and Slovaks and what they did here in, in these four years. They, uh, the Legionnaires in particular in Russia um, riveted the world's attention. Um, world leaders really stood up and take, took notice. People like Teddy Roosevelt was out of office, and he was amazed. Um, they fought very bravely and very effectively. Um, they were perhaps the most effective revolutionary army in, in world history. And despite having no country of their own at the time, uh, to protect them, no experienced military leaders. They didn't have a, a George Washington. They didn't have a Napoleon. Um, and despite being surrounded by hostile armies in the vastness of Siberia, they defended themselves. They defeated their adversaries for a while. They actually created a better future for themselves and uh, for their compatriots back in Europe. And they did this against impossible odds. Um, if, you, if you write down this story in about 25 words, 35 words, you tell somebody, this is what happened. Most people would have to tell you it couldn't have happened. It just couldn't have. Um, of course, all, all of this, almost all of this, came to be forgotten in 1938 when uh, the Nazis invaded um, Czechoslovakia and, and wiped out history and wiped out any memory of these heroes. Um, and again, of course, it happened again in 1948 when Soviet Russia took its turn um, absorbing Czechoslovakia. Um, and in fact, the Russians tried to erase this remarkable story in much the same way they would erase remarkable people, and they do that by sending them to Siberia. So it made some kind of ironic sense that I first heard about this story on a trek across Siberia in 1993. It was um, only 20 months after the implosion of the Soviet Union, and um, some people I know, and I, we, we just were curious about what that place was like. It had been closed off, sort of like North Korea, for decades, and everyone was curious what it looked like, so we went. Um, I traveled about 2,000 miles um, from the Trans-Siberian, and um, it was late summer, so we didn't have to dress like this. Uh, 
these are two uh, legionnaires at the height of winter, of course, when the temperature plunges well below zero pretty much every day, uh, below zero Fahrenheit. Um, our trip was shortened from the 5,000 miles you might think you can do to 2,000 because there's no bathing facilities on the Trans-Siberian, at least not the train we were on. So it was an adventure in hygiene. Um, for the first time in my life, I learned what bed bugs are. When I woke up in the morning and my legs were covered in red welts, I, I, did, I thought I had a rash. I, did, I didn't know. Um, when we asked for cream for our coffee at the Soviet hotel, we got the Soviet answer, which is niet. Um, the, passion, the passenger cabin of our Aeroflot jet was full of angry flies and broken seats. And I noticed that the Russians um, in, the, in the plane were incredibly, deathly quiet, not talking to each other. They just looked scared. Um, I didn't know why. Um, but later on, I learned that Aeroflot Airlines was uh, crashing uh, all the time in 93. Um, the Soviet Union had, you know, had sort of fallen apart, and everything was kind of falling apart, literally. And they were killing more passengers, five times more passengers than any other airline in the world at that time. Um, but we were lucky. This didn't happen. So we continued with our journey. The key point was that there were some briefing materials for the trip. And... Um, it, it made passing reference to a, an army of men, 50,000 men, who, who marched back and forth across Siberia at the end of World War I. And I know that Siberia is big enough to, to go from Honolulu, Hawaii, to New York City. And so getting across it just once um, is remarkable. Doing it several times is oddly remarkable, more remarkable. And, um, but I also wondered why these men were in Siberia, if the war is in Europe, if the war is ending, why are they fighting? Who are they fighting? What is this about? So I thought, but it sounds like, it's, it sounds like a dramatic, you know, National Geographic special. So I'll, I'll go back home and I'll, I'll, I'll buy the book. And I'll read the book. Uh, but when I get back home to the States, I, I really couldn't find any good history of this, not in English. I found two, two English language versions of the tale that were written in the 20s or 30s, but neither of, the, neither of them had any, like a bibliography or any footnotes or any, any reference to references at all. I didn't quite know where they got their information from, didn't quite trust it. Uh, there was a memoir written by a legionnaire in, the, in 1939. He, he moved to London. I think he knew English really well. He wrote a great memoir, and I used it in my book. But, but the other two books, and nothing else, frankly, had any perspective on what these men were thinking or feeling at the time. Uh, if, you, if you read a – they're mentioned in history books, like histories of the, of the Russian Revolution, but they're always spoken about sort of objectified, you know, they did this, they did that, and we don't like this, and we like that, but you never heard their voices. So I, um, I started to work on this, and, um, um, and I was really encouraged by the fact that I began to, to discover that other people, not just me, um, really thought this was a terrific, I mean, a terrific epic story. Um, people like uh, a younger Winston Churchill, who was in office in 1918, he had a long career. People associate him with World War II, but he was in the British War Cabinet in World War I. Um, former President Teddy Roosevelt took notice. Uh, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. Of course, uh, Woodrow Wilson, our president, took notice. The, the British novelist and spy, Somerset Maugham, he was in Russia, and he got to meet the, the Czechs and Slovaks, and he was amazed. He said, um, they are organized like a department store and disciplined like a Prussian regiment. I thought that was a great quote. And, uh, and the Soviet leaders, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, they also spoke in public in terms of awe about the, the Czechs and Slovaks, um, but they expressed their awe in a kind of angry way. They, uh, they had reason to be angry at the Czechs and Slovaks. So I, I spent 23 years of my spare time uh, to write a book I could not find, um, but it only really came together in 2002 when I acquired, uh, discovered on eBay, of all places, um, five volumes um, like 450 firsthand stories in five volumes. They were published in Prague in the 1920s. And uh, I got them on eBay from a guy in Switzerland for like 65 bucks. And then I, I hired a, a really um, professional Czech-American translator who had worked for the White House and the castle. Um, and I, he quoted me a, a good price, and I, I raised money. I raised $48,000 uh, to, to have him translate 400,000 words. And, and what these stories were were the firsthand accounts of the men themselves. Apparently, when they got back to Prague, they were sat down and said, like, tell us, what happened to you? What, you know, in this crazy four, six-year-long adventure, 
what was the most interesting thing that happened to you? So you have these terrific random firsthand stories, and I incorporated them into, uh, into the, uh, the story. Um, and once I had that, I knew I had a book. Um, the publishing world disagreed. Uh, so like most new book projects by new authors, um, this book was rejected uh, over and over and over again. At least 12 agents and 24 publishers declined to publish it, most of them, sadly, because what they said repeatedly was that serious works of nonfiction are rarely profitable. Sad. But then I come across this quote from Winston Churchill, um, which makes me feel that I'm not crazy. I'm not wasting my time in a weird guy's hobby or something. But and Churchill was not only an impressive leader, he was a very good writer. People might forget that. He, um, perhaps a great writer. At his death, he left behind more published words than did Charles Dickens and William Shakespeare combined. And in 1953, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, which is not bad. Um, he personally followed the exploits of the Legion um, in office. In fact, he, he took a special interest in them, shall we say. And um, so he knew what had happened. But more important to me, he also knew what a good story was. And what, um, and what Churchill said about this tale, um, when I saw this, I said, wow, I have my first blurb. The pages of history recall scarcely any parallel, parallel episode at once so romantic in character or so extensive in scale. And Churchill was not um, an easy guy to impress. Um, yeah, I still wonder why he didn't write this book, but he thought it was interesting and worthwhile. Um, A.J.P. Taylor, another, another British historian, really put together in one quote um, my whole book, in, in a sense. So I read his history of World War I. I was always looking in all kinds of books. I must have read 10,000 books to look for fragments of this story. Um, so in his history of World War I, which is not that thick, but it's kind of a classic, so I read it, um, he takes an odd interest in a minor, if violent, skirmish among former prisoners of war at a train station at a place called Chelyabinsk, Siberia, on May 14, 1918. I thought that's really strange. So why would a British history of World War I bother to describe a fight among POWs in Siberia? What's the connection? What's the point? Well, the Czech and Slovak legionnaires were at the center of this incident on May 14, 1918, which is it's pretty critical. It's at the center of the story. Um, there was a fight. And two men were left dead, but it lit a fuse to a series of explosions across Siberia, Russia, and Europe, and among them was the collapse of Austria-Hungary and its Habsburg dynasty. And A.J.P. Taylor's quote was, was this. He said, in this strange way, the death blow to an empire, centuries old, was struck far away on the railway platform at Chelyabinsk. Um, this made my day when I saw this. This is how... This is what it looks like to connect the dots in history. Um, you have to read and go through a lot of dots to find the right ones, but um, that's what it looks like. And this is how I piece together the story. So a little background on how we came to this situation. So World War I, about 7.8 million um, soldiers were sent by Austria-Hungary um, to the Eastern Front, which we in America tend to ignore. Uh, we tend to focus on the Western Front. But on the Eastern Front, Austria-Hungary uh, fought, for the most part, Russia and Serbia. Uh, on the Western Front, for the most part, Germany fought Britain and France. Uh, we arrive in this war at the 11th hour, um, but it goes on for a long time without us. Um, these men suffered a great deal in battle, almost unspeakable conditions. Um, but what was different about the Eastern Front was that there were these vast movements of armies back and forth, just like the old days, they would say. Um, the Western Front is locked into muddy trenches where not much happens except that people have to get out and die. And that's it. Um, on the Eastern Front, the, the, the size of the Russian army and the fact that they were mostly illiterate peasants, they would just charge. And many of them would die, but the fact is the fronts move back and forth. And what that means is that there's prisoners. So um, 2.1 million um, Austro-Hungarian soldiers are taken prisoner by Russia, 2.1 million. Uh, keep in mind, too, this is a war that was going to be over in six months. Um, they're spread out over 300 um, POW camps, most of them in Siberia or Central Asia, what we call Central Asia today. Um, 
about 210 to 250,000 were Czech or Slovak. I think 30,000 were Slovak. And of course, Russia was completely unprepared to shelter, feed, or care for these prisoners. Completely unprepared, meaning they had no plans to take hardly any prisoners. They had 2.1 million people. So results, uh, epidemics, of course, break out in these camps. Disease spreads, wounds, infections, and fevers go untreated, and there's no food. Um, at one camp in Omsk, Siberia, 16,000 POWs died in just the first year. At another camp, the Russian staff, staff fled the camp uh, due to a, a disease that was spreading and left the men to die. Final estimates for Austro-Hungarian soldiers who survived the war but didn't survive the camps uh, ranges from 375,000 to 450,000 men who died, in effect, from neglect. After they survive that period, um, what happens to them but a professor of philosophy, of all things, shows up in Russia. Um, the czarist regime had collapsed. The provisional government took control. The Bolsheviks are conspiring, getting ready to take over, but they're not in power yet. Um, and this, this wild, wild-eyed professor from Prague shows up, Tomas Masaryk, and he has a a wildly ambitious plan and a wildly ambitious pitch for these men. Um, he's a fugitive now in exile. And when he went into exile, he thought he could um, get in touch with the Allies without getting caught. He got caught right away. In effect, he could not go home again. He was a fugitive. He would absolutely be imprisoned. High chance, high likelihood he'd be executed. So, um, and he's now, in, in 1915, he's 65 years old which today is like, you know, 70, 75, I think. Um, he's not young, uh, but now he's in a, in a death struggle because he can't go home and again. He can't go home. He's never going to see his wife and four kids again. And um, he's always going to be on the run unless, unless he destroys Austria-Hungary. Um, so he, he says to the men, look, join my army. I have an army. The French are going to support us. Join this army. We're going to organize ourselves under a French flag. We're going to cross Siberia. We're going to get on ships in Vladivostok. We're going to circle the globe. We're going to land in France. We're going to go to the Western Front. And um, if we do all of this, they, they might give us a country. That was the pitch. Um, so so 50,000 men um, initially signed up and said yes, which is remarkable. And, um, and they become the co-founders, these men, of Czechoslovakia. But Masaryk, of course, had a few other friends. Um, chief among them, uh, a former student, Edvard Benesch, who was, you know, maybe 30 years old, a former uh, student of his, um, who joined him in exile. Another former student, uh, the Slovak Milan Stefanik, uh, who was now a dashing French army officer and pilot. He helped out. Um, Emmanuel Vasco, a Czech-American businessman who deserves his own book, who during the war, he, he, he owned a stone quarry and he owned a Czech-American newspaper he had like six kids, but he turns into one of the most uh, effective American spy masters, I guess you call them, in American history. Um, he is in charge of espionage. Uh, Charles Crane, a very wealthy um, industrialist from Chicago who uh, met Masaryk at random for some random reason back in the 1890s and became a supporter, very wealthy guy. Um, and. Uh, Crane is the largest single contributor to Woodrow Wilson's first presidential campaign in 1912. Uh, and then his son, uh, forget his name, Charles uh, Richard, Richard Crane. Richard Crane, his son, Harvard educated, uh, becomes an aide to Secretary of State Robert Lansing. So Crane is really wired into Washington. Um, and that's, he's a good friend to have. Um, Without the efforts of these other people, the legionnaires in Siberia would have achieved little or nothing. Um, so they're both equally important, though, because without the legionnaires, as I'll explain in a minute or show you, uh, Masaryk probably would have failed in his efforts to get uh, his own country. There could be no doubt that the liberation of the Czechs and Slovaks would not have begun in earnest and probably would not have been achieved without the drive, determination, and dedication of Tomas Masaryk. Um, while he was not the only important person, the only person important to this, to this effort, this cause, 
I believe he was, as Americans say about George Washington, the indispensable man. Um, when war broke out, uh, before the war, he and the, his fellow Czechs and the Slovaks, actually, separately, were trying to get what we might call equal rights in, in, inside the empire, autonomy and equal rights inside the empire to be equal to the Austrians and the Hungarians. But once the war broke out, uh, there's a couple things that happened. Masaryk became convinced that if Austria-Hungary won the war, or even just survived the war, that they would become uh, much more arrogant and much more powerful and less likely to grant the Czechs and Slovaks their autonomy. But Masaryk also developed a guilty conscience, which might have been more motivating. So for many years, he taught students. And many of the students he taught, of course, were Czechs, uh, also Slovaks, but also even um, Croatians and Slovenian students, Serbian students who would find their way to Prague. And he admitted later on that he encouraged them to think of a better life in a different way, to live a different way in a different, maybe a different country. Um, and now they're, um, they're on the front and they're, they're dying uh, for this regime they all hate. But then he hears, and I corroborated this, that this actually happened, um, Czech, Czechs in the army, in the Austro-Hungarian army, tried to defect to the Russian lines as early as September 1914. So September 1914 is the war is still young and it's, it's barely begun. It means that the Czechs are trying to defect almost immediately. Um, they, they put up a white flag and they tried to talk to the Russians and they started to walk across some field or land and, and the Russians just mowed them all down um, and they, they all died. Um, later on, when I was going through my research, I, I read a story from a guy who said, who corroborated this. He said, yeah, we, we wanted to defect to the Russians, and we waved. So in other words, a guy who survived this incident had a story in those volumes that I had gotten uh, off, of, uh, off of eBay. So this horrified Masaryk, but then there was one further thing that really horrified him, and this is something that remains an issue today. Um, he encouraged the spirit of independence in his students, but many Czechs and Slovaks, if not a majority, thought that independence would come from Russia, that Russia was going to invade Austria-Hungary, move into Bohemia, Moravia, uh, Slovakia, and liberate the Czechs and the Slovaks. Um, this idea horrified Masaryk because he knew Russia better than they did. Um, a, a much more famous and accomplished and well-known Czech politician was this guy. Karel Kramarsh, Kramash, Kramash, he was a, a very prominent Czech politician. He was um, active in the pan-Slavic movement, meaning where all Slavs would get their independence together. Uh, he married the daughter of a wealthy uh, Russian industrialist. And until 1917, uh, he and his wife owned a villa in the Russian Crimea. Um, what was more threatening um, to the Czechoslovak legion however, I mean, to the Czechs and the Slovaks and the cause of independence, was that the Legion actually originated as a unit inside the Russian Imperial Army. So a small unit um, built around emigres, Czech emigres in Russia, Slovak emigres. They volunteer for the Russian Army because they pretty much have to, and they form this special reconnaissance unit. So it begins in Russia, in a sense. And um, it was led by Russian officers, but these volunteers were very useful to Russia, and so really the action is taking place in Russia. Um, over time, the unit began accepting Czech and Slovak POWs, so it begins to grow. And by the time Masaryk gets to Russia in 1917, it has about 10,000 men in it. Also, something in Russia called the Union of Czechoslovak Organizations was a potential rival to the global organization Masaryk was trying to create. Um, they were doing a lot of work, working with the Russians, and it looked like an independence movement was, giving, was, was being born inside Russia. And finally, in response to a request from Masaryk that others join him in exile, he's, he's sort of out there alone, you know, living out of suitcases. Um, they, they, uh, the people in Prague, the Czechs in Prague, send a guy to Russia. Um, but it turns out he's pro-Russian too. He undermines Masaryk. Um, and turns against them and, and is turning the movement into a Russian movement, basically. So Masaryk knew Russia better than most people. I found this. I thought this was hilarious. That's Russia over there, of course. Um, 
Masaryk had visited Russia many times. I mean, many of its cities, down to Odessa, St. Petersburg, Moscow. Um, he had uh, three separate long personal meetings with Leo Tolstoy, in which the two of them began arguing. He, um, he wrote a book, a really serious, acclaimed sort of intellectual history of Russia called um, The Spirit of Russia. That's the English translation. The, the German, it was published in Germany, it was called Russia and Europe, basically, in German. It was a, a very serious book, two volumes, but it was widely acclaimed as the first book that taught Westerners about Russia. And when he was working on the book, he took the, the manuscript to the Isle of Capri off the coast of Naples and, and met there with, um, with the writer Maxim Gorky, another Russian. He, he read the, the language. He read the literature. Um, he knew that Russia would never liberate the Czechs and Slovaks because Russia had never liberated the Russians. So, um, so Masaryk was open to Western ideas. Uh, he was that rare Slavic scholar who, who talked, uh, you know, who, who discussed with the students Western philosophy, and um, and um, and, then he, and then he turned that theoretical preference for the West into a tangible American presence in his life when he met and married a young woman from Brooklyn, Charlotte Garrick. Um, so this is where he is when he goes out into exile. He's done, he's done a lot of work, and, um, but he really thinks that the independence movement has to be directed toward the West, at the West, and supported uh, by the West. So the whole movement begins um, for him. It begins badly, just like the soldiers. So the soldiers are dying on the Eastern Front, and Masaryk makes his move. And uh, so in December of 1914, he's 64 at this point, he decides to reach out to Allied officials and explore his idea um, that they might help to liberate his peoples. He sneaks across the border and meets secretly, he thinks, with Allied diplomats in Rome. Um, the Czechs and Slovaks, he tells them, are willing to help the Allies defeat Austria-Hungary. And most Allied diplomats at that time would not know a Slovak if they tripped over him. Um, they knew nothing about the Czechs and Slovaks, but he has this story to tell. Um, so he, he makes his pitch. He gets the word out. Returning to Prague, he gets a, a message that his meetings had been entirely um, discovered, and uh, he can't come back to uh, Prague where the police are looking for him. Um, if he returns, of course, he'd, he'd be punished. So he's living out of a suitcase. He's cut off from, from his family and his contacts in Prague. He's technically unemployed, uh, has no income, and he's a fugitive, wanted for treason. And uh, he now faced the possibility that he would die in exile uh, for an independence movement that most people would have seen as hopeless. Hopeless because, as I said, the, the world knew nothing about the Czechs and Slovaks, which I found surprising, but it, people just didn't know a lot about the rest of the world back then. Um, Allied leaders knew virtually nothing about them. Even academic specialists on Austria-Hungary uh, and its nationalities were very rare, and Masaryk had the good sense to know both of them. Um, the French, of course, long mistook the gypsies in Paris for bohemians, uh, converting a geographic error into a halo for the artists and drifters immortalized in, in Puccini's La Bohème. Uh, the Slovaks were even less well-known. Independence, if it came, would take years, and Masaryk was not young. If he, if he were not to die in obscurity, lost to his family, forgotten at home, he would have to travel the world to educate the Allied countries about his peoples. He would have to secure a series of meetings with the leaders of the world's most powerful countries, and then he'd have to use languages that he knew only secondhand to convince them, first, that his peoples actually existed, and second, that they had to draw up an entirely new map of Europe to liberate them. No big deal. So he threw himself to work, and um, he created this espionage network of volunteers, some of them young, some old, some married, some single, who learned, uh, they did this, this stuff you see in old-fashioned movies, they write something down, roll it up and put it inside a pen, or, or open up the seams of a coat and stuff stuff in the seams. And So they had this worldwide intelligence agent, uh, agents um, all around the world, because Mastery had to know what, what's going on in Vienna, what's going on in Prague, what's going on at the front, Oh, and what's going on with the Allies? What are they thinking? What are they doing? So Paris, London, eventually Washington. He has to know all this. 
Um, he also started to raise money, including raising some money in the United States, including, no doubt, here in the great state of Nebraska among Czech Americans. Um, and things began to break. So Milan Stefanik, who I admire a lot, well, this is a – I saw this. I thought of, I thought of Master in Exile, an old man in exile with not much time left. It's a great picture. This is Milan Stefanik. He's Slovak. As a kid, he had found his way to Prague, was a student of Masaryk's, um, was fascinated with astronomy. So he got his PhD in astronomy at uh, Charles University in Prague. He was wildly sort of ambitious and energetic. Um, I think he was all of like five foot five. Um, he goes to France and he ends up exploring the world as an astronomer for France. So the French love him for this. Um, he gets a lot of medals and promotions. And so he's now an officer in the French army. He's also a pilot. That becomes important later. Um, so he had the first of several crashes on the Eastern Front. I, I think Serbia, he crashed. Um, these are the old biplanes. So this is the first time planes are being used in war, and the planes are not real reliable. Uh, so he crashes. Um, he makes his way all the way back to Paris. Uh, he has major surgery of some kind. Um, as far as I could tell, he never got completely better. There was something wrong with him physically um, for the rest of the war. Um, but he comes out of surgery, and uh, Masaryk and Benesh go to see him, and he goes, I'll get you a meeting with the French prime minister, Aristide Briand. And he does. And Aristide Briand was one of those rare, rare people who actually knew who the Czechs and the Slovaks were. And Briand at some point asked the, you know, asked the, the generals, why don't we invade Europe up through, you know, up through uh, Italy or you know, the Balkans? Because if we get to Austria-Hungary, the Czechs and the Slovaks might help us. People don't know what he's talking about, so they just ignore him. But he knew who they were. So Brian meets with Masaryk. It's the first meeting. And after the meeting, better yet, Brian steps out into public and issues a, a communique that says the French have a lot of sympathy for the aspirations of the Czechs and the Slovaks. That's not a promise of anything, but that's pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. The big break came in early 17, though, 1917, when Tsar Nicholas II abdicated. Um, and um, Masaryk could then slip into Russia. So his book about Russia was banned by the Russians. He was not liked in Russia. He couldn't go to Russia when the Tsar was still in power. Now he can. And he has another key friend. He had these key friends around the world in key places. So another historian, politician, um, joins the provisional government as the foreign minister. And uh, so he has a friend in Russia at this point. He gets to Russia. He gets the uh, permission of the Russians to let his Czechs and Slovaks come out of the POW camps. He just happens to run into a French minister in St. Petersburg. Uh, he says, I, I can give you 30,000 warm bodies. And this is really important because the French and the British are running out of young men. I mean, quite literally, there's like a demographic uh, death struggle between, you know, Young men born when? Uh, in the 1890s, and young men killed in the 19-teens. And the number of kills are exceeding the number of births. They're literally running out of young men. So when this guy comes along and says, I can give you 30,000 combat veterans to the French, the answer is obviously weak right away. So the French promise money for this army that Masaryk says he can somehow get to the Western Front. Um, his aides, Masaryk and his aides, uh, visit the camps all across Russia and delivered their audacious sales pitch um, for this wildly ambitious plan. And, um, and like I said, 50,000 men said yes, remarkably. Now, granted, easily 175, 200,000 said no. And, and some people have pointed out that at the end of the war, more Czechs and Slovaks died fighting for Austria-Hungary then joined this legion. But the fact is that these legionnaires were the co-founders of a new country that destroyed Austria-Hungary. So they made their choice, and they apparently made the right choice. The men uh, had no nation they could call home. They had no recognized or experienced military leaders. They had no evident means of support. They had few supplies, ad hoc organization, uncertain legal status, questionable loyalties, and at various moments in the battles to come, too few weapons. And the last piece of the puzzle falls uh, into place in October 1917 when the Bolsheviks seize power and withdraw Russia from the war. 
But by now, uh, Master Week has his 50,000. He just needs to get them out of Russia. They're all gathered in Ukraine, what we call Ukraine today, which was then part of Russia, but not for long. But, um, and they're going to go by train from Ukraine to Vladivostok, which is well over 5,000 miles. They assemble 72 trains, and each train is 10 to 20 cars. Um, and they manage to gather a lot of material. So when the Russian army disintegrates all around them, it just, it just melts away. The men just leave their post. They're able to grab a lot of weapons. Um, when they start out of Ukraine, they, ha they actually have an airplane or two. They have vehicles in these trains. They have um, artillery, uh, massive quantities of weapons. They are really well armed. And Russia, uh, the Russian army is gone, basically. It just disappeared. Um, so it looks good. It looks good. The minute the trains start to enter Russian territory, uh, the Red Army uh, units and the Bolsheviks start demanding these weapons back. Um, and they also want the locomotives. Locomotives are falling uh, scarce, becoming scarce. They want the locomotives and they want the weapons. And of course, if you lose those, you pretty much have lost everything. Um, so the, uh, but the Bolshevik regime, the new regime, the Soviet regime, uh, in, in, uh, that had moved the, the government to Moscow, they gave permission for the Legion to cross Russia. It's important to know that. Uh, personally, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, they were all in the room. They said yes. Uh, they mostly wanted the Legionnaires to get the heck out of their country. They saw them as wildly dangerous, perhaps. But um, they weren't threatening anyone, but they wanted this foreign army off their soil. So they got permission to do this. And that's important to know because... Um, you know, 10 minutes later, they're being told they, they can't leave and they can't keep their weapons. So they started off on this journey um, and very in March of uh, 1918. And it didn't take long. By April, the first trains are arriving in Vladivostok, which sounds good. But the problem is the last trains are around Penza, which is not too far over the Ukraine border. Russia is in total chaos. So it's very hard to move trains. They move very slowly. And there's a lot of things that are going wrong. Um, so they're stretched out over, over well over, let's say, 5,000 miles. In, in, and they're in groups. Um, like there might be 5,000 here, 8,000 here, 15,000 here. And in between them are these Red Army factions. They're surrounded by the Red Army. Um, the key event takes place, as I said earlier, on May 14th, 1918. It had all the dignity of a barroom brawl when a, a brief but furious altercation leaves two men lying dead at the, on the train platform at the, the sleepy railroad station outside the frontier town of Chelyabinsk. Um, Chelyabinsk, like every city at that time, was governed, in effect, by a committee, which was called a Soviet. Um, and so um, at the station, a, a still loyal Hungarian soldier is in a train full of Austro-Hungarian soldiers, and they're going uh, west, back home, back to the front, back to the war, back to Austria-Hungary. And, of course, the train going in the other direction um, strikes them as odd because these guys also have tattered, some of them have tattered Austro-Hungarian uniforms on, but they're going in the wrong direction. They're going to the Pacific Ocean. They're going to, where are they going? The men uh, stop at the station in these two trains. They stop, they get out, they share food, they talk. It was all pretty peaceful. Um, I, the Hungarians knew what the Czechs and Slovaks were doing. Mostly they would disapprove of it. Many of them might have been angry, but nothing had happened. Um, but when the Hungarian train takes, uh, takes off, starts leaving the station, a big chunk of metal comes through one of the windows. It hits one of the Czechs in the head, apparently, and by all accounts kills him. Um, the Czechs um, and Slovaks run after this train. Uh, fist fights break out, um, a lot of yelling and cursing. Um, they demand to know who threw the metal, and eventually the Hungarians point to a guy. Um, the Czech soldiers uh, leapt on him and killed him, beat him to death, and shot him right away. Uh, officers tried to intervene. They did intervene, but they couldn't stop it before this guy was dead. Um, the local Soviet is eight or 10 or 12 people who've been elected to be you know, the governors of the city. They don't have any experience. Um, they want to be good little Bolsheviks, but communications to Moscow is very it takes forever, and nobody knows what's going on. So um, what they decide to do is they take uh, everybody to the, to the city and uh, take them all in for questioning, but they let the, the Hungarians go, and the Hungarian train takes off. The Czechs, there was like maybe 10 of them, um, are not let go. Uh, 
So at the station where the checks are headquartered, which is about two and a half miles from the city, um, at the station, the commander sends two or three more checks into town to find out what's going on. They get arrested. They don't come back. Nothing, nothing happens. So he sends in, I think, again, two or three more people to find out what's going on. They get arrested. And apparently, he, he knows now, a few days later, that this is what's happening. So he organizes 3,000 men. They march into Chelyabinsk um, with the weapons they had. And um, because they, by the way, they had given up a lot of weapons by now to the Bolsheviks. They, they thought that would get them out of there. So they didn't have any weapons now. They go into town. They manage to free their comrades. They, they do it at gunpoint. Um, they don't kill anybody or actually shoot anybody because they didn't want to. They didn't want to go to war with Russia. Uh, two or three of their men were killed, um, but they get the guys out. They do take a bunch of weapons from the town's armory, and they tell the commissar and the Soviet, like, we're not at war with Russia. We're not going to try to take over your town. We just wanted our men out. We're leaving. We're going. We're going out. We're leaving. Um, the commissar was pretty much okay with that. He didn't know what else to do. So, but he did send a report to Moscow. And when Trotsky hears about this, he, I guess he was having a bad day, um, he loses his cool. Um, I, I guess from the perspective of Moscow, he, he sees these legionnaires taking over his country or something. He, he loses his, his cool. And, and one of the things he forgets is that the legionnaires are all along the Trans-Siberian, and the only telegraph line across Siberia is next to the Trans-Siberian. It's right there. The telegraph operators are in the train stations. That's, that's how it is. Um, that's all there is in Siberia at this point. There's a train tracks and a telegraph line, and that's civilization. Um, so the Czechs uh, along at various station stops have made friends with the telegraph operators, and so Trotsky starts issuing these really violent orders, and, of course, the Czechs are reading them. Um, so they get a heads up. Um, he issued many telegrams and orders, but basically it was, in effect, if you see a check with a weapon, shoot him dead on sight. And if you see a check without a weapon, uh, you know, take him prisoner and we'll put him in camps. So these men are going, they're going to either die or go to camps. And remember, they had been in the camps before. So they, um, they break out into a revolt in late May. And um, in short order, they, uh, they attack every city along the entire Trans-Siberian. So imagine if you're in one city, but you're surrounded by Red Army people, and then your comrades are down to this city, and others are over here. So when the revolt breaks out, the Czechs and Slovaks uh, advance and race in both directions. They're all, they all want to link up. The only unit that didn't have to go in two directions was the one way out you know, in Penza. They only wanted to go – they went one direction. So there's a lot of furious fighting over the summer of 19, uh, 1918. Oh, by the way, this is Masaryk there uh, recruiting the men for the, uh, for the Legion. That's him with the X on his jacket in Kiev. This is the Trans-Siberian. Um, you see Chelyabinsk. You see Samara. Uh, Penza is like southwest of uh, Samara. So the men are, you know, southwest of Samara all the way across the Vlad to Vladivostok when the fighting breaks out. And, um, and this, these are the cities, the major cities along the Trans-Siberian, and the dates they fell to the Czechoslovak Legion. So the fighting broke out on May 25th, and they took Novosibirsk in the, in, uh, the next day. They, they officially took uh, Chelyabinsk uh, two days later. They had to go back into town. Um, and there was a lot of fighting. Uh, there was one battle where the Czechs uh, had no weapons. They had none. At one point, they were down to one rifle, I think, for every 10 men, and that wasn't enough. So there was one battle, actually, where the Czechs and Slovaks filled their hands and their pockets with rocks. And I guess they thought they had nothing to lose. They attacked the, the Bolsheviks with rocks and, and, and took their weapons. Um, and that's how it went. Um, although with time, <clears throat> excuse me, with time, they start to gather weapons from these battles. So they're getting armed again. So it, it goes until about uh, early September when they take Kovarovsk um, on September 5th. Oh, and, and during these, these, this fighting, uh, about 15,000 more Czechs and Slovaks joined the Legion, uh, bringing it up to about 65,000. Um, so the, they only want to get out of Russia. They're doing this to defend themselves. They think if they clear the line, then finally they can just move those trains again and just resume their journey. But during the fighting, there are some unintended consequences. When the Legion advances on the uh, – 
on the city where the Romanov family was secretly held um, in July of 1918. Uh, they don't know the Romanovs are there. Nobody knows where the Romanovs are. The people in, in, in the city, Katerinaburg, um, suspect that they're in this house that's been surrounded by a stockade fence, and there's like 300 guards or something. So people suspect that they know who's in there, and the guards drink at night and talk too much. And so, so the people in this city or town know that the Romanovs are in this house, but the world does not know. Um, the Legion advances on the city, and uh, Lenin decides that they're not going to fall into anybody's hands and so he issues a, an order, a direct order, uh, to the locals to uh, execute uh, both the Tsar and his entire family. Um, they denied this for decades, but the, uh, it's been confirmed since the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, it was an unintended consequence. After the war, after this is over, Masaryk uh, still has a tendency to get like, angry that people thought it was their fault. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's his fault, but... There's things in his memoirs about, he's kind of grumpy about this topic because he doesn't want to be blamed for the, the murder of the czar and uh, his family. Um, and, of course, the, this rebellion also gives Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, the direct impetus to send U.S. troops into Russia for the first time and the last time, we can hope. Um, U.S. troops were sent into Siberia in the Allied intervention explicitly to aid the Czechs and the Slovaks. Um, that's not something you'd learn if you read like, a superficial history of, of that episode. Um, and this becomes absolutely critical, and it becomes like the last thing that has to happen to get the Czechs and Slovaks uh, to get their independence. But first, I wanted to say a few words about the global political campaign that was waged for independence, because they, the two things come together. The fighting in Siberia and the politics comes together, and it comes together inside the White House. So Masaryk's single most important supporter was this man, Charles Crane. Uh, he loved Russian culture, uh, Slavic music, Orthodox church rituals. He uh, was actually invited uh, as an American to the coronation of Tsar Nicholas II in 1896. I can't imagine there were many Americans, uh, many other Americans invited. And in, this is 1896, and on the return journey home is when he meets Masaryk. He stops in Prague, and he's heard about this great Slavic professor and writer and and so he wants to meet him. The two hit it off right away. And uh, Crane becomes a big fan of Masaryk. He um, actually pays for Masaryk to come to America twice for speaking tours. Um, and, and Masaryk spoke everywhere, on the East Coast, big cities, small towns. He probably was in Nebraska. I know he was in Iowa. Uh, so twice he comes to America, and, and newspapers interview him. So Czech Americans and Slovak Americans figure out who this guy is, and he looks like, you know, they're George Washington. There's nobody else like him um, doing this kind of work. Um, and, of course, as I said earlier, Crane was a big supporter of Woodrow Wilson's uh, campaigns for president. Another uh, important supporter was this guy. This is Emanuel Vasca, and I wish I had a better photo. So this is the guy who uh, starts the espionage network for, for – he does it for Massery, but he ends up getting such great intel – that the British want it, and then they start funneling this intel to the British and then to the American government as well. And it turns out that he's uncovering plots and other things that uh, the British and the Americans don't know about. And um, I can't get into it today, but I mean, it, it actually, Vasca's work might have been a contributing factor to the Americans getting into the war, because he's the one who uncovers a lot of this uh, sabotage. You might have heard about the Germans in this country and the and the Austrians are doing sabotage at defense plants and, and ships and all that. And he uncovers this because guess what? He finds Czechs and Slovaks on, the, on these ships, or he finds them in these factories, and he gets a relationship with them. He also turns uh, uh, chauffeurs and, uh, and maids at the Austro-Hungarian embassy into his spies. Um, so he, does, he does amazing work. Um, he was actually ended up as a U.S. Army captain because of uh, his work. And then Masaryk arrives in, in uh, the U.S. in May of 19, uh, 1918. This is uh, two pictures from Chicago. They say that 100,000 people uh, met him in Chicago. That looks credible by this picture here. That's him in this, uh, the top photo. That's him like at the center right, uh, leaning a little bit. And, of course, at the bottom he's on the right um, with prominent Czech Americans, prominent Slovak Americans. Um, he... Uh, and so in America, the Czech and Slovak independence movement, which in Europe is entirely about diplomacy, 
meetings, money, propaganda, communiques, but it's all, you can miss it. You can live in France your whole life and miss this whole campaign. In America, it becomes a political campaign. It becomes this wildly democratic, enthusiastic thing because of the many Czechs and Slovaks who live here. So um, Wilson comes to America primarily to meet with Wilson. He's met top people um, in, in London, top people in Paris. Now he needs to get the Americans uh, because America declared war in April 1917. Um, we're not really, we're kind of late to the actual war. It takes a while to, to build the army that we didn't have. Um, um, but anyway, Wilson's now going to have a seat at the table at the end of the war, so he needs to get to Wilson because he wants there to be an independent Czechoslovak country. Um, but Masaryk had two habits, um, two bad habits, uh, when it came to the Slovaks. So he's, he's touring the country, waiting for a meeting with Wilson. He's not getting that meeting right away. Um, things are actually not looking good for his meeting with Wilson at all. So he tours the country and wants to talk to his Czechs and Slovaks and get them excited. Um, but he had two bad habits when it came to the Slovaks. His first habit was to claim that, uh, at this point, he claims that Czechs and Slovaks are the same people, that Slovaks, quote, belong to our nationality. Um, and that, quote, the Slovaks are Bohemians. And it's just not true. Um, they are distinct people, and, um, and he knew it. His other habit was, and this was kind of weird because he's in America, and there are, keep in mind there are probably more Slovaks, Slovak Americans, than Czech Americans. It's not, it's not like they're a small group you can forget. There are at least as many Slovaks as Czechs, maybe more. So, But he still had this other habit of... Um, of failing to mention the Slovaks at all in his speeches. He would talk about the Czechs, the Czechs, you know, and half the audience is Slovak. So he does this, um, um, he does this at, at a big public meeting somewhere, and the Slovaks in the audience get really angry, and they demand to see him, and they put in front of him something that came to be known as the Pittsburgh Agreement. It was based on something known as the Cleveland Agreement, but basically, the Czechs and the Slovaks in America had come together um, and decided, yes, we could be, we, our compatriots back home can be in their own country, but the Slovaks want autonomy. Um, the Cleveland Agreement, it's brief, but it's clear that, that Slovak, what they had in mind, because they're Americans, so what they have in mind is Nebraska and Wisconsin, or California and New York, so Czechs and Slovaks. To an American, that's so simple and so obvious. It's not, it's not complicated. Uh, Masaryk either didn't appreciate it or didn't want to, um, but, um, but he signs the agreement anyway. He's handed this agreement in Pittsburgh on May 30th, 1918. He's in the meeting. He's got no choice. He signs the agreement. Um, he signed it actually a second time in November before he left this country to go back home and become president. He signed it twice, and um, um, as we all know, he, uh, those, are, those promises for for autonomy were never, were never met. And um, I can talk about that later if you like. But the Russian Revolution, for one thing, America's declaration of war, for another, and growing Allied support for the Czechs and the Slovaks encourage even the Slovaks to think, this is winning. We're winning. We're finally going to get what we want. So if things have been going badly, they might have had a worse time with mastery, but they're winning, basically. So they, they put it aside. After the war, we can fix this. Um, so, and, and the Czechs and the, and the Slovaks are just doing all kinds of things. At one point, so many, so many telegrams went to the White House from Czechs and Slovaks that the Associated Press filed a story about it. They're, they're testifying before Congress. They're having rallies, and they're raising a lot of money. Um, Czechs and Slovaks in this country raised at least a million dollars for the cause, if not, if not two million. So finally... Um, Wilson, uh, I'm sorry, Mastery gets to Washington. When he arrives at Union Station, 27 members of the House and Senate walk to the station in the summer in D.C. to greet his train, which is pretty amazing. So everything looks good, um, but the problem was this. Uh, Masaryk had already given um, interviews to newspapers, I uh, couldn't take them back, where he wanted his legionnaires out of Russia, which is always what he wanted, but he also didn't want any kind of other intervention in Russia. Um, if there was going to be an intervention in Russia, he figured they would make the Czechs and the Slovaks fight. Uh, and he didn't want that. So he said he's against intervention in Russia. 
Actually, there was many good reasons not to intervene in Russia, because as we all know, it was tried and it failed miserably. Um, but Wilson is under enormous moral pressure from the French and the British. Keep in mind now, we're, we're in the summer of 1918, and I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions of British and French have died. Paris was evacuated twice. And what have we done, right? Um, we didn't have much of an army in 1917. It was pathetic. Um, and we have to build the army and create it. Then we have to get it to Europe. It's, it's an enormous enterprise, and it's taken a while. So, so Wilson wants to do something to answer these pleas. He wants to appease the British and the French, at least. So he sits down and figures out that this is what he'll do. And of course, he's hearing about the Czechs and the Slovaks, and they want independence. So what he decides to do, he decides to send US troops to Russia. And what he says, though, is that they're not going there to intervene. Um, they're going there to rescue the Czechs and the Slovaks. He makes this decision in July, when the Czechs and the Slovaks were still fighting. Um, as it turns out, our US troops cannot get there altogether with their general, William Graves, until September 1st. That's when the general's there, the troops there, and they're all ready to go. Which is ironic, because September 1st, 1918, was the day, somewhere in the middle of Siberia, when the last Czech and the last Slovak actually joined up, and they controlled the whole railway, all 5,000 miles. They didn't need to be rescued. When our troops get to Siberia, um, there's nothing for them to do. And, um, and the General Graves was under strict orders to do nothing other than rescue the Czechs and the Slovaks. And he arrives and finds that he does not need to do that. And so he and the troops more or less sit in Siberia doing a whole lot of nothing uh, for a few years. Um, and so Master Week, though, is making little headway in Washington. He's not, he has a meeting with Lansing, the Secretary of State. Lansing says, we need intervention in Russia. Master Week says no. He finally has a meeting with Wilson. Same uncomfortable, inconclusive discussion, no. But something else is happening. American newspapermen and other newspaper people are in Siberia, and they're writing about the Legion. So even though that was a difficult thing to do 100 years ago, there were actual correspondents in Siberia filing these stories. And the exploits of the Legion is filling American newspapers. And Americans, I think not just Czech Americans or Slovak Americans, but all Americans are amazed by this story, like I was. And they're, it's creating like a, a, a sensation in this country about, wow, who are these people? What are they doing? And, and aren't they helping our cause and all this? And so um, editorial support uh, turns out for Czechoslovak independence. And, um, and, it, and this affects, of course, Wilson. But then there was one more thing about all this. It's very publicized. It's very popular, the Legion. And now Wilson has kind of put his foot in it because he now has sent U.S. troops to Russia. And what he said is, is that they're there to rescue the Czechs and the Slovaks. It doesn't matter almost now that they don't need to be rescued because now Wilson has, it's, it's unclear whether he realized this at the time, but he's actually committed himself now to independence for the Czechs and the Slovaks. And the reason is, and I've never seen anybody actually put this on paper, but he couldn't easily rescue um, the Czechs and the Slovaks and, and use US troops to do that. And then when he was done rescuing them, turn them back over to Austria-Hungary. And they wouldn't have any other place to go. So he's really, he's really um, crossed the line here. Um, he already was thinking about supporting independence for all the nationalities in Austria-Hungary. He says he hadn't committed to that position yet, but by putting the, our troops in the, these are the US troops, the cavalry in the Vladivostok, by doing this, he's really committed himself. Because, you know, in many countries, if Vladimir Putin can get away with this, but an, an American president can't, you know, use U.S. troops to rescue people and then throw them into jail and, and have them hung or executed. It's not going to happen. So he's, uh, so the Legion really does, uh, in many ways, um, help the independence movement because the publicity behind it, even though they're kind of stuck there fighting the wrong people, the publicity around it drew attention to the independence movement. And now Masaryk is knocking on the White House door. And so finally, um, Wilson comes around and, uh, and decides that he would support um, Czech and Slovak independence. And um, at the same time, the British and the French do it as well. Um, and the, uh, the Declaration of Independence is drafted by, by uh, Masaryk on, uh, in Washington, D.C.
and it all happens out. And come, you know, it all happens as you know it did happen. But I, I wanted to show you um, some pictures of the legionnaires themselves. So this is them with a, a, a collection of weapons that they had captured, no doubt, from Russians. I don't know when it was. I don't know if it was early on uh, from the Russian Imperial Army or from the Bolsheviks, but they're pretty proud of this collection. Um, this is the guys posing in front of a train. If you notice, they had the Russian hats on. Um, this was pretty early on when um, there was a lot of Russian uniforms dropped on the road, you know, just dropped behind, and they were, I guess, free. Um, but also some of these guys had actually served in the Russian army. I like the kid in the front and center, the really, this kid down here. He looks like he's 14. Um, it's either scary or cute. I'm not sure which. Um, this is them marching. You can see how long this column is. If you look off to the upper right, I mean, it's a huge column of men. This is them on the march. These are some of the war dead after one of their battles. This is some of the men who survived, the wounded. And, uh, and that's all I've got. Thank you. You got all time? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Yeah, it was, um, it, was, it was sort of the downside of the whole story. So there really was a shortage of ships worldwide um, as a result of the war, as a result of German submarines sinking any ship that moved across the Atlantic. I sometimes think that the Jolly Green Giant could run across the Atlantic without getting his feet wet by hitting the hulls of ships. I mean, there's, there's at least hundreds of ships at the bottom of the Atlantic. So there's a worldwide shortage of, of ships. And um, the Czechs and Slovaks were skeptical about that. Um, long story short, they were stuck in, in Siberia for uh, up to about 1920. Um, they were, some of them were duped into fighting the Bolsheviks in remote places for no apparent purpose. They were bitter about that. They, were, and started, they started to mutiny. Uh, Stefanik was sent to Siberia at one point, and he was visibly sick. And he's sent there to tell the men, in effect, A, I'm sorry, B, it's not going to change, and C, you just have to hang in there. Uh, one officer, at least, one legionnaire officer, um, ordered his men into battle, and the, the men refused, and he, he went to his cabin and shot himself. Um, it was a bitter, bitter period. Part of the problem, there's many problems, but part of the problem is that Versailles starts to get organized, and now the leaders of the free world have to sit there and figure out who all these people are around the world who want their own country. There's a lot of work to be done. And so they're really, really busy. There are no ships. There really aren't. Uh, and then Wilson has his stroke, which doesn't help. Uh, he's completely, completely um, out of the picture for months, if not longer. Um, so the men, basically, the men ended up there, most of them, a lot of them. Uh, the, last, the last ship taking the last legionnaires um, was 1920. Um, and... Um, so these various ships, at one point the Legionnaires actually got a ship to go to Tokyo where they bought a used ship. They named it the Legi. They took it back across, you know, to, to Vladivostok, and the first ship that went out was owned by them. Uh, but then they were out of money, and that was it. Um, they, they eventually made it all the way over. So these ships took all kinds of journeys back. So some went south, around Southeast Asia, Indian Ocean, Suez Canal, Mediterranean, uh, Trieste, maybe, or some other port. Uh, other ships went um, the other way across the Pacific, uh, Panama Canal. Some went to San Diego and took a railroad. Some went to Vancouver, Canada, railroad, across new ship in the Atlantic, across Potsdam. I mean, all these journeys took place. And some of the stories I had was about these wild journeys uh, home. Um, the last ship was uh, Slovaks. Some people would find that ironic. Uh, the, last, the last guys out are Slovak. And that ship was met in Potsdam by a minor diplomat um, in Potsdam, 1920. Uh, and that minor diplomat um, later on uh, became uh, Vaclav Havel's uh, grandfather. It was his grandfather. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was tough and it was bitter. Uh, some of the stories you'll read from the Legionnaires are full of bitterness. I mean, I think justifiably so about that period. 
Um, keep in mind, they're still fighting and doing something in Siberia. They're not sure what it is, but they're cold, they're hungry, and sometimes they're fighting. And back home, everyone's celebrating. They have their country. So they would ask, why am I in Russia? Um, there wasn't a good answer. Yes? Um, in your research on uh, Mazarese, if I'm pronouncing the name right, I think so. Um, was there any talk about uh, when Czechoslovakia's uh, finally, the geography of it settled upon, uh, was there any trepidation about ethnic Germans being included in that? I, I think there was a second largest ethnicity. Yeah. Um, did they think, okay, that's great, more people, more resources, or were they thinking this could be a, a challenge? Well, I, I think Masaryk was both a good man and a great man, but he was a politician, and he did a lot. And if, if you spend a lot of time doing a lot on the world stage, you're, you're going to fib once in a while. So in 19, I think it was 06, before the war, he writes an article saying we can't be independent. He's telling his Czechs and Slovaks, we can't be independent. And one of the reasons is all those Germans among us, and he means the Sudeten Germans. Um, Later on, um, he doesn't talk about it anymore. Woodrow Wilson, after it's all over, and he, Wilson is going to Paris on a ship, and he's talking to somebody, and about and this topic comes up with the Germans, and Wilson says to this other person, it might have been Lansing, Master Week never told me. But it turns out that Wilson was also fibbing. So Wilson had written a book called The State. It was a political science book. It was published in, I think, the 1880s, maybe 1888. And in the book, he describes a lot of countries around the world. Sure enough, get the book, open it up. He knows about them. He mentions the Germans in Bohemia and Moravia and how they're a problem. That, and that, a real problem, not just that they happen to be there, but they're a problem. So Wilson's fibbing. Masaryk's fibbing a little bit. I think that Masaryk was, um, well, first of all, the map of Slovakia was drafted by um, Masaryk himself. Um, I know he probably had some help, some support, but he literally left Prague with a drawing of what Slovakia would be because it didn't exist. Literally, it's made up. It's not that it's wrong, but I'm saying like it's completely the, you know, the first map of Slovakia ever, 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 so it's kind of made up. On the, about the, uh, Bohemia and Moravia, though, Bohemia and Moravia actually existed in some prior iteration of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, Bohemia, it was called then, was an elector of the Holy Roman Emperor, and there were only seven or eight. So it was a real place. It had a dynasty. It was real. And what Masary consisted upon was that the borders of that kingdom would be the Czech half of his country. Um, he could have excluded the Germans, maybe, and then had the, just the Czech, you know, just the Czech part with the Slovaks. But he always insisted that that kingdom was what he was fighting for its restoration. He did know there were Germans there. Yeah, so the New Republic has, um, you know, like three million Germans and, and two million Slovaks and about three quarters of a million Hungarians. Uh, the borders were drawn in some cases. Um, the Hungarians mostly came because Bratislava, which becomes the capital of Slovakia, is right on the Danube. Um, they don't feel comfortable looking across the river at any other country like Hungary. Um, among the relations among these people are not friendly. The Poles, the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, they're not friendly with each other. Um, so uh, Wilson convinces, and Benesh himself convinces the Allies to go across the river and take the, uh, the, the southern banks of the Danube uh, there, where they pick up all these Hungarians, because they wanted to control some section of the Danube. Um, bottom line is the Czechs comprise slightly less than 50 percent of Czechoslovakia. It's like 49.7 percent which is not enough to say that we Czechs are the natural rulers because we're the majority. After all, everyone talks about self-determination, democracy, and that means majority rule, so who's the majority? So in order to hold it together, in order to hold off the Germans in some fashion, they start to pretend that the Czechs and the Slovaks are one people, there's one language, and what they do is they they drop, a, I'm a big grammarian, you know, as an editor. They drop the hyphen. <laughs> the hyphen is just so important. You can tell the whole story about this, this, this history with talking about the hyphen. Everyone had hyphenated Czechoslovak up until this point. The Czechoslovak National Council in Paris hyphenated. The Czechoslovak Legion hyphenated. 
There's correspondence by Masaryk. There's correspondence by Wilson. Hyphenated, hyphenated, hyphenated. And then suddenly in 1918, 1919, the hyphen disappears. It's like a detective story. Where did the hyphen go? Yeah, the hyphen went. Uh, and they started to say that there was one Czechoslovak language, one Czechoslovak people. But anybody who knew anything knew that it wasn't really true. Um, and the Slovaks, of course, proved it after you know, over the next however many decades. Um, they did this for, you know, out of fear. I, I, it's not like they did it out of a, a desire, a lust for conquest. They, they, it wasn't that. Um, I do think they could have given the Slovaks autonomy and still kept them loyal. But th there was a question about if you give someone autonomy, do they then go to the next stage and want independence? At that, at that point, the Czechs would have been doomed. Um, but anyway, so it got complicated. They didn't fix the Slovak problem. They didn't fix the German problem. And they never really were able to defend themselves against Germany and Russia uh, until they joined NATO like 10 years ago. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think um, it's a great question. Um, so Masterbeek's work and Ben Escher's work and Stefanik's work was really quite effective. Um, like at one point, Stefanik comes to America and, and approaches um, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt is a sworn enemy of Woodrow Wilson. Now, Masterbeek's strategy is we're with, the, in effect, the Democrats, Wilson. Um, Masterbeek would never have gone to Roosevelt. Roosevelt humiliates Wilson in every public comment and every speech. But Stefanik thinks, we're not getting enough help around here. So he goes to see, on his own, Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt then starts making speeches in favor of Czechoslovak independence. Although when he does so, he makes a jab at Wilson. Um, Masaryk might not have appreciated that, but the three of them did a lot of things like that. They raised a lot of money. They had a lot of great connections. They had a lot of, a lot of powerful friends. Um, they still might have secured independence for the Czechs and the Slovaks, but I don't know. Um, when Wilson got into this, had this idea in his head about self-determination of peoples, I, I get the sense sometimes that he thought there were like three more peoples in Europe and we'll just give them countries and that's the end of it. Um, he had no idea of the intermixture of populations that even today still exists. There are Hungarians in Romania and there's Germans in Hungary and you know, still to this day. And he had no idea of how many other peoples there were and what the problems were. Um, it might have worked. It might have worked because they did things, other than the Legion and the fighting, they did things that almost no other group did. Uh, the Kurds, I tell people, the Kurds got wind of this, what was going on in Versailles, and, and they sent two people to Paris. They said, hey, you know, we want our own country too. Um, and nobody paid any attention to them. But they hadn't really worked it either. They hadn't worked the process. Um, 100 years later, they're still asking for their own country. Um, I, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that when you fight for your independence, literally, so the American colonial war against Great Britain, when you fight for something, people take you seriously. The Czechs and the Slovaks in Europe were not fighting. Um, there were some demonstrations, but there were no riots, and there was no insurrection, and there was no revolt. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like a deafening silence from Prague and Bratislava almost. And at one point, the emperor uh, sort of like pressures the leading Czech politicians to swear loyalty. And this is like 1916, 1917, and they swear loyalty. What the Legion does or is, is it's, it's the revolt. It's the insurrection of the Czechs and the Slovaks. It just so happens that it's taking place in Siberia. Um, and arguably, it's helping the allies, you know, kind of weirdly and Maybe so that was decisive and the, the both the political and the military were then decisive. Um, the political stuff was still really good, though. I mean, it was really good, really effective. Um, the fact that Masaryk was married to an American, I don't know, made it, maybe made him more comfortable understanding how America is because it's not like Europe at the time. But that's a great question. Yes, James. I, I read, I had, the, I had them translated, and um, I, I spent a lot of time trying to track down the, the editor, the guy who was listed as the editor, Adolf Zeman. But Zeman's a pretty common name in the Czech Republic. 
I, I couldn't find anything on him. And, um, and, the, and the book itself doesn't tell you. But the way it reads, so, so most people, um, especially 100 years ago, so literacy 100 years ago, the Czech and Slovak lands was, you know, not anywhere near 100 percent. And even today, when people are literate, they're not always great writers. So when you read these stories in English, um, it's clear that the persons or person who wrote them, probably more than one person, had an education, at least to like an eighth or tenth grade level, which is pretty good back then, um, and could write coherent sentences and a, tell a coherent story. So my only guess, and I'm guessing the, the soldiers, most of them wouldn't or couldn't write that story. So my guess is they sat them down when they got back. They were like, like celebrities. So they sat them down, I think. It, it looks like they sat them down and said, tell me your most amazing story. Uh, and some of them told more than one story. Because the stories are completely idiosyncratic and all over the map. They're just, some of them are crazy. Some of them are kind of irrelevant. They're silly. They're very personal. But that tells me that this was the wide open way in which they probably did this. I'm guessing, um, you know, that people who had an education sat down with typewriters and uh, just, you know, just recorded the stories and then and probably, you know, polished them up and cleaned them up a little bit. Uh, but there's clearly a, a first person voice in all of them. There's no, there's no sense of a narrator at all. They're very personal and they're very, yeah, they're just very personal. It's hard to describe them otherwise. And some of them are, are kind of silly and not relevant, but when you read, you know, hundreds of stories, you really then begin to get a sense of what, you know, a, a real sense of what the guys were thinking. And, you know, they confessed to, uh, they were honest about, you know, how they treated that guy in Chelyabinsk that killed him. They were honest about their fears all the time, about all the issues they had. Um, and this is what I wanted to hear, because they, they themselves made decisions that nobody else made for them. When they went into revolt, keep in mind, they had already now committed treason against Austria-Hungary. But when Maastricht left them behind in Russia, he said, above all, don't get involved in Russian affairs. So when they go into a revolt, they can't speak to Maastricht. He's, he's, he's out of touch. So they're actually revolting against Maastricht, technically. Maastricht, when he first learned about what had happened, he had no problem with it. But they technically were revolting even against their own independence movement. So they were in control of their actions. They, but they only spoke of fear all the time, uh, mostly, of fear and desperation to get out. Um, so um, the, the stories are, are really interesting, and, um, and the volumes uh, gathered dust for many, many years in Prague. Yes, sir. Well, how they organized themselves was, 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 was kind of funny because what they did is, um, you know, the, the Soviet army came apart when the Bolsheviks infiltrated the army and created these little committees, which they called Soviets, right? But what they were there to do was undermine, right, undermine. Well, this committee business was getting popular. So the legionnaires created committees, um, a committee structure, and they had meetings, and they took notes, you know, uh, and, you know. So they were organized that way. Like, like, like the, the novelist said, they were very organized. But it was as a result of committee. So I think committees appointed, uh, there were three guys especially, or four, who were appointed as their first generals. And they ranged in age from 26 to 32. And one of them had been like a dental or medical person in the Austro-Hungarian army. Like none of them had any promise because they had no experience. You know, Czechs were not promoted into the senior ranks of the Austro-Hungarian army. So there wasn't much chance to learn, uh, you know, but anyway, they were either good or great. But again, if, if you're surrounded by enemies who you think are going to try to kill you or put you in jail, everyone's motivated, you know. Uh, and initially, at least in the initial battles, everyone knew what they had to do because the alternative was unspeakable. Um, it did get dicey later on um, when things got more difficult. There, there was a lot of dissatisfaction. There were moments of uh, mutiny inside the Legion. Um, but no, they appointed... Um, three or four young guys who turned out to be good, you know, it worked. So. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Who paid for the transportation uh, across the ocean? Because some of them went through Japan, I yes. understand. Yes. I understand there were even units which went through Omaha. Yeah. And yeah. people were yeah. paying them. Yeah. 
The Brits paid for about 25 percent, and the Americans paid the other 75 percent. I think one of the — one of the, like, 12 different reasons why the whole thing was delayed was that I think, you know, we were going hat in hand around, like, come on, you know, everybody cough up some money. The French had pointed out that they had paid for everything else they had. So — and no one else was interested. So getting the — however many millions it was out of the U.S. government took a while, again, in part because of Wilson's incapacity. So, yeah, we and the British paid for it, which becomes something, you know, you hear a lot about in world history, like we and the Brits doing the lion's share of work. Yeah, and so some of the trains landed in San Diego and across the country, and, yeah, they came through Washington at one point. At one point, they came through Washington, so they did a little parade in front of the White House in the pouring rain. But Wilson came out, and he was kind of recovered by now and spoke. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And then some of them wanted to come back here. And a handful of these people went to Prague, turned around and came back here and lived here in America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very, very quickly. So uh, Americans were recruited for another legion in France. It was much smaller um, on the Western Front. Um, that also helped because we actually did get to the Western Front and fight. Uh, the Czechs and Slovaks did. So a lot, of them, a lot of them died. And then there was a tiny sort of legion in Italy among, it was formed from among POWs. Didn't have a lot of chance to fight, but again, they show up, right, and they volunteer, and they say they're for the Allies, and that, that makes an impression. Yes, sir. Yeah, real complicated. Um, one of the reasons the Bolsheviks were able to take power is that, you know, there's like 37 factions, and, and when there's 37 factions, you don't have to be very big to, to win, right? It's, it's, it's a numbers game. Um, people f think about and write about a lot about the whites, the so-called whites, Mostly, I think they're thinking about the Russian uh, Imperial Army officers who obviously weren't going to be Bolshevik and were in Siberia. And people said they wanted to bring back the Tsar, but they didn't. But really, the most effective and, and the most numerous opponents of the Bolsheviks were other revolutionaries. There were two, there was one big party called the Social Revolutionary Party or something, or the Socialist Revolutionary Party. It was so big that it, it, it also split into two. There was the left Socialist Revolutionary Party and the right Socialist Re and, and they would assassinate people. One of them uh, shot Lenin at one point, didn't kill him. Um, a, a lot of the opposition to the Bolsheviks, anyway, was coming from the left. Um, when the Legion would clear a city, a lot of these opponents of Bolsheviks would sort of come out into the sunshine and applaud the Legion. Um, but they, had a, they also had a very revolutionary agenda. The white Russians mostly didn't want to fight. Um, they were officers, and they thought other peasants fought. They don't fight. So they were like egging the legionnaires on, but they would sit back in the city and, you know, at the hotels and with female company and dinners and waiting for the legionnaires to overthrow the Bolsheviks or something. It was very convoluted. And then there was the, the Japanese. So the Japanese wanted to go into Siberia basically, to be honest, just to take timber and gold and whatever. Um, they, nobody admits this, but, but they want to go into Siberia, and, and, um, and Wilson reaches a deal. Uh, we're going to send 7,000 men, and you'll send 7,000 men. They'll be even, and we'll watch each other and, you know, play nice. So we agree to, you know, we're going to send our 7,000, and they send 70,000. Um, so, and the Japanese are, they're, just, they're there not for any apparent reason. You have to know what their real agenda is, because otherwise you look at them, 70,000 men, and you would wonder, what are they doing here? except that they're engaging in fights, fist fights, random attacks on everybody else. There were more than a few Americans who were killed by Japanese in Siberia just for being Americans. Shot down on the street. Uh, at one point, the Japanese attacked an American train, killed a lot of guys. Again, unclear why. Uh, they gave money to the worst white elements to cause trouble. Um, you see a lot of aggression in this story from the Japanese, which really is like a harbinger of things to come. There is a, a, a viral aggressiveness among the Japanese down to the level of privates, just wildly aggressive and violent. Um, and they, but they don't have a, a particular goal that they're, they feel free to uh, enunciate, so they're just there. 
causing trouble. Um, so there's a lot of factions, um, a lot of them. Um, the Americans should never have been a part of it. It was never going to be successful. Um, Masaryk himself knew that if you wanted to, the whole point, just so you know, the whole point of the Allied intervention was to get Allied troops into Siberia, but then had them go 5,000 miles in the other direction, somehow cross all of Russia without Russia minding. That would be remarkable. And somehow cross Ukraine and cross Belarus and keep going until you meet a German and then kill him. Um, they were going to reopen the Eastern Front that way. What well, was never going to happen? It would take two million troops to do that. It would take hundreds of thousands of troops just to watch your railroad behind you. It would never happen. Um, so sending 7,000 or 700,000 wasn't going to do it either. And so the Allied intervention is a colossal failure. And Wilson's ex explanation of it is hilarious and sad at the same time. He keeps talking about how we're going to help the Russians. And people will look at him and go, well, this group of Russians wants to kill this group of Russians. So, you know, would you tell us which group of Russians we're going to help? And he, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. So it was a real mess. Um, the legionnaires got caught up in it. Some say the Civil War, that Allied intervention in Civil War, would not have been as violent and not as extensive if the Legion hadn't been there because they really were the most effective fighting force. But they didn't want to be there. You can write like a comic opera about the Allied intervention. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Thank you.